Will you pray together with me? God, creator and lover of all the universe, do not walk ahead, we may not follow, do not walk behind us, we may not lead. Walk beside us and be transformed as we are transformed. Amen. Amen. Well, here I stand, less than two months from graduation. It's been three long years in the making. Now I know we are not all in the same boat. Some of you are indeed my fellow third years. Some of you are tweeners, that's uh, second years. And some are finishing up their first year. One of us, I won't say who, is beyond our years, but that's neither here nor there. We have gathered together to learn about religion and stuff. But during my three years, I have come back to one persistent question. What does all that I learn have to say about the human condition? In preparation for today's sermon, I did what one's supposed to do, exegete. In investigating the various liturgical calendars and feast days, I was haunted continually by the question, what does this have to do with the human condition? Sunday was her day. That is Mary, Jesus' mother. The date was March 25th, nine months to the day that Christ will be born. It is the day that marks the Annunciation to Mary that her son will, quote, be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. It was a day that revered the birth of Jesus, the Annunciation unto Mary, but it also reminds us that her son will soon die. She remembers his birth while fearing his death. Yesterday was her day, that is St. Margaret of Clithrow. It is the feast day in the Catholic Church for the 16th century English lay Catholic who refused to renounce her faith during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. It is her life people remember, but her death people do not forget. And today is his day. That's Charles Brent. Brent, an Episcopal priest, lived in the early part of the 20th century. Today, the Episcopal Church holds a feast day for the man who served as a missionary to the Philippines and worked on several commissions to stop worldwide narcotic trafficking. Perhaps his greatest accomplishment is forming what the Commission on Faith and Order within the World Council of Churches, whose mission is to, quote, proclaim the oneness of the Church of Jesus Christ and to call the churches to the goal of visible unity. The scripture today comes from Brent's feast day. It makes sense. Brent became a laborer for the harvest. He went throughout the world as a missionary, working to end narcotic trafficking, but also forming an ecumenical dialogue still in operation today. But there's another twist to this liturgical adventure. This past Sunday marked the beginning of Passion Time, the time in which the sufferings of Jesus become the chief focus of the church. Crosses are covered and images in the church may be observed, and crosses remain covered until the end of the celebration of the Lord's Passion on Good Friday. <clears throat> Jesus, walking through the region, teaches, heals, and had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Palestine was crowded with religious leaders. Religion was robust with a crowded temple, synagogue, Sadducee and priests, Essenes, and other sectarian groups. However, priests and laymen had made religion their chief business, which in turn neglected the people, sometimes leaving them thrown down and left helpless. And yet here I am, focusing on liturgical calendars and scholarship about what each day means. The Annunciation, St. Margaret, Charles Brent, Passion Tide. I find myself focusing more upon the religion than on the harvest. I find myself focusing more upon human-created days than on the God-given life all around. But there still might be hope. Jesus had compassion on them. In the Greek, this word is spelunktomai, which means to be moved from one's bowels for compassion. As I read this, I wonder how our liturgical calendar, how our ritual, how our weekly interaction with ancient practice moves us from our bowels. Perhaps the Annunciation <clears throat> provides insight. We remember and hear each year at the beginning of the Advent season these words, but we hear them now on the way to Golgotha. Now, I've never been a mother, but I have a mother. I cannot imagine the pain of any mother felt when her child has been killed. 
It's the pain of Trayvon Martin's mother, the young man recently killed in Florida. Trayvon was visiting his father, returning from a nearby store, when self-appointed neighborhood watchman George Zimmerman saw him and thought he looked suspicious. Zimmerman followed Martin, confronted him, and then shot him in the chest. Trayvon had a bag of skills. Zimmerman a 9mm handgun. Trayvon's mother says simply, that was my baby, and he was pleading for his life. And I cannot help but wonder if Mary uttered similar words. Then there's St. Margaret of Clithrow. In 1586, she was arrested and called before the jury of the crime of harboring Roman Catholic priests. <clears throat> She regularly held masses in her home in York, England. There was actually a hole cut between the attics of her house and the adjoining house to enable a priest to escape in the event of a raid. She refused to plead to the case, so to prevent a trial that would entail her children being made to testify, and therefore they would be tortured. She was ordered to die on Good Friday. She was stripped and a handkerchief tied across her face, then laid out on her back upon a sharp rock the size of a man's fist, a door was put on top of her, and slowly loaded with an immense weight of rocks and stones, the small sharp rock would break her back within minutes. She died within 15 minutes. But she laid there for six hours, because that's how long it took to remove the weight of the stones. A harvester she became. She felt this call to be a harvester and her compassion for protecting those deemed religious dissidents. She found herself dying on a cross of wood and stones. Charles Brent, he did not suffer. He did not die from persecution. He did not usurp governmental power, but he had a dream. A dream for unity within the Christian world, a dream that remains hopeful and alive today. At the first conference in 1927, there were over 400 participants, representing 127 Orthodox, Anglican, Reformation, and Free Churches. Assembled under the leadership of Brent, they were to, quote, register the apparent level of fundamental agreements within the conference and the grave points of disagreement remaining. The harvest was plentiful. A harvest for unity. And it's at this point I want to tell you that each of us is called to be a laborer. We each have our own crosses to bear, and it is our job to get to work. We have justice to carry out. We have hatred to dispel, love to share, and inequality to reckon. I want to challenge you like Jesus did, but I can't. I can't stand here and tell you to get out into the fields and reap the harvest. I can't tell you, because before Jesus said the harvest is great and the laborers few, he had compassion. And in this spring season, as vegetables bellow from below the soil, as Flowers sing and bloom as spring rains descend upon the fields. We are reminded that the harvest has yet to come, but it is on its way. In this season of growing, this season of change, we are reminded that we are always in transition, always changing. <clears throat> this Lenten season, we do not find ourselves at the end of the passage being told to go out and be laborers. We find ourselves needing the compassion of Jesus. Perhaps you are in need of healing from afflictions of both body and soul, from cancer to blindness, MS to deafness. Healing seems a distant dream. But perhaps our desire for healing is also a desire to be valued or heard. There's no mention of exactly what or whom Jesus healed, only that he healed. Could healing be listening to stories and being affected by them? For those in privileges, challenges with whom people associate with and what it means to be Christ-like. It decenters the idea of power from a vertical structure to a horizontal structure. This means that Christ is affected by those less in society's eyes and that we might be well served to do the same. For those that work to help others day in and day out, it could mean that while we are called to help people, we need compassion too. Jesus' affliction from the bowels, with compassion, demonstrates that we can be transformed and changed as well. So while we help, we are helped. While we assist in transformation, we are transformed. We are caught 
in between the world of going and staying, of receiving compassion and extending compassion. We find ourselves in this Lenten season between the recognition that Easter comes, but Good Friday comes first. With it, the tears, the pain, the sadness, and the fact that sometimes believing in a resurrection seems nearly impossible. Jesus went throughout the villages, healing and binding, and afflicted deep within his bowels by the crowds. He told his disciples that compassionate leadership was needed. He urged them to protest to God for more leaders. Their leaders had become corrupt, but their leaders did not listen to those that suffered. Protest to the Lord. Why? Why are there not harvesters and leaders that care for the disinherited? Why are there not leaders that focus on the downtrodden? My God... My God, why are there no leaders that see the holy within us? And now the cross is cloaked. And we ask why. Why must the one who had compassion be taken from us? The cloaked cross reminds us and urges us to focus upon the suffering of Jesus. Normally that veil is stained purple, but I'm not so sure that color works for me anymore. Stained red by those who have died because of their race or creed, because of their differing opinions, is a veil thrown upon the cross. Stained blue by the tears of mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters who have lost loved ones to senseless violence and bigotry, is a veil thrown upon the cross. Stained brown by the soil and land pillaged by the demand for progress and change is a veil thrown upon the cross. Stained green by the money unequally distributed and left over from economic injustice is a veil thrown upon the cross. Colors of injustice and suffering come together and blended they become the color of a moonless night or a black hoodie shrouding the cross. On the cross, we place a veil to remember the suffering throughout the world. To remember those that are like sheep without a shepherd, needing healing, needing hope. We place our own sufferings upon the cross, not to escape them, but to acknowledge that we need compassion and healing. So here I am, standing less than two months away from graduation. Where are you in your journey? What in your life stares? at you, what has made you feel like a sheep without a shepherd? I can't tell you that Jesus will make it all okay. And I can't promise you that what we struggle with will fade with the night. I wish I knew how suffering could end in an instant. Or knew when God would finally make our struggles and our sufferings disappear. The only balm I can suggest is to sit into the stories. I wish I could tell Trayvon Martin's family that the pain will go away, but I can't. I wish I could tell the chronically hungry that the pain will go away. I wish I could tell the young man molested by his father that the pain will go away, but I can't. All I can say is that there are the stories of the multitudes of afflicted, downtrodden and weak, and Jesus had the deepest compassion of all I can say is that there was a mother long ago who lost a son to corruption and bigotry. All I can say is that there was a woman that was killed because she protected priests from death. All I can say is that the cross is veiled with the sufferings of all. So in preparation for today's sermon, I did what one's supposed to do, exegete. In investigating the various liturgical calendars and feast days, I was haunted by the question, what does this have to do with the human condition? <clears throat> this was what I found. Amen.